Yeah. Professional here. <laughs> well, man, let me, t I have to tell you just because this is funny to me. You are the first person since I started doing these remote podcasts who has been early. Like you were like five minutes early to the call. It's literally the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> you know, punctuality is something that is new for me. Um, really? Yeah. Um, I used to be late for everything. And then I don't know, it was this pandemic thing. It's just made me like on time and like on it, you know? I mean, I guess there's really no excuse to be late when you're just in your house. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't have to like, how long is it going to take to get here? And Google maps it and all that shit. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I mean, you've been, you converted your whole house. It feels like into a, a, a workspace into a club space. Pretty I mean, much. there's been plenty of people who have been streaming from their house or whatever, but I feel like you've been doing it on a different level. Yeah. I mean, it was literally like, um, we, uh, Gabriel and Dresden, uh, we re released an album on January 17th, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> and we had all the best intentions of touring that globally. We had like 45 dates all around the world through, you know, August of 2020. And when it all got canceled on literally one day, I remember it was the 13th of March. I was like, I got to do something. I, I'm, I'm going to drive myself crazy. You know, I need music. And so I was like, I'm going to learn how to stream. And I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. But like, I was like, grabbed a table. Uh, it was a, actually a dresser. It was only 32 inches high. So I had to like, you know, like crouch down to DJ. <laughs> and uh, I grabbed my girlfriend's decks because I didn't have my own, but she had some and mixer and, uh, and just learned how to do it. And it, literally half of my house is like consumed by this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> how long of a period was it from March 13th when you found out all of your plans for this year were canceled, which I assume were extensive, you know, an album a, campaign, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, just getting, you know, it was just getting started. I think our first tour dates had been like the end of January. And so we had pretty much most of February that those dates can't happen. But then March 13th, like literally like this one's canceled, this one's postponed, this one's moving it to another date. And they all thought, everybody thought it was going to be a month, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And you remember so, that when we thought it was like, oh yeah, we'll just stay inside for three weeks and it'll be yeah, fine. Exactly. And so, um, you know, like there were some definitely, I, I announced some tour dates that were going to move to May. Sorry, guys, we have to move the date to May. You understand, right? And like, <laughs> you know, t all tickets will be uh, valid for this new date. Unless you can't make it, then you get a refund. You know, the whole shit. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, I mean, it was like, so from, uh, it literally took me a week to learn how to do this. Like, right. And but how was, quickly, I guess, is what I'm asking. From March 13th, you know, are, are you the kind of person where the second you realized that this was going to be longer than people thought or that, you know, things had flipped and this just wasn't going to happen anymore? Did you sort of just immediately decide you had to figure out something else to do? Yes, because I knew I would go crazy not being able to. Because I had, you know, when you, when you work, you know, when you plan on a world tour, you're expecting to entertain people for a long time to come. Yeah. And that to me, it would have been a crushing blow to not fulfill any musical communication like that. And so there was no information on the internet on how to really stream like on Twitch. Right. I, I, I found something that, that, it was like literally like a uh, clue finding, like this, <laughs> this article told me about OBS and this article told me about the cameras I'm going to need. And this one's how to connect your mixer to OBS and all that. So I had to piece things together. And that's what took me until March 19th to come on. <laughs> and I also had to convince my music partner, Josh Gabriel, that this is what we need to be doing. Because he was like, no, we don't need to be streaming. We're going to make a sound pack. Then we're going to sell it on Splice. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because we had heard that, you know, there's, 
pretty good money uh, on Splice. And we yeah. actually, uh, that was the thing that I was doing concurrently with learning how to stream was making a sound library from our last album. Hmm. That, that was the concept. We were going to make a sample library from the album we released in January. That's a good idea. And we did it. We, you know, it took about two or three days of just chopping, you know, going into the audio folder of each song and like, what, this is a good one. This is a good one. Deciding whether or not the raw sound is the one we want to use or the process sound is what we want to use. Right. Um, but that was, that was the number one plan we had. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't know, we had no idea that the streaming thing would actually take off. So he was like, yeah, yeah, if you want to stream, go ahead, do a stream, right? And, right. and I was like, I'm going to do the first one on Facebook, and not knowing that it was going to get cut. Oh, and, right, of course. Yeah, before we knew about any of that stuff. Right, yeah. I had, I had never, ever, ever streamed music to the internet prior. Like, right. we had done a couple of Q&A Facebook lives, but that was about it. So, which is so funny because you've put music on the internet and been involved in people hearing music for basically your whole life and your whole career, right? Definitely, uh huh. And, and then just this one slight change to the paradigm, and yeah. all of us had to relearn everything. It's just so funny to think about, man. I have a fear of cameras. Mm. And like, I've, I, it's always, I've always felt weird behind a camera and then adding a microphone to the whole thing is even more stressful. What about on stage? Is it the same thing? Stage is fine because, you know, like, I don't know. I just got, I got used to that, but um, I never got on the mic ever in a club. Okay. Like maybe once or twice. I don't know because I was drinking. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Would Josh do that? I, never, I did not feel comfortable. But would Josh do that or were you guys the, the duo who were just never on the mic? Never on the mic. Josh is actually even more, um, you know, he, he gets very self-conscious on the mic. So um, he definitely, like if there was ever an announcement that needed to be made in a, in a club setting, it was me. Right. <laughs> and I, I had no, I, I actually, I for, you know, I forgot I had a history in radio, uh, which actually... <laughs> is what has helped this whole streaming thing is that I have a history in radio, but I, I forgot like mm. that I used to talk on mics all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, let's, you know, I was reading up on some of your background and there was definitely some things I had no idea about, you know, before I really looked into it. You were born in Connecticut, right? Yes. Or raised uh -huh. in Connecticut? Yes, I, I lived there until I was 30. I'm 51 now. So I've been in California for 21 years. And man, um, till you're 30, that's, that's a lot of time to put in in Connecticut, man. Yeah. I, um, well, the thing that I think really helped was I grew up on New York radio and I got to go to New York club venues and hear some of the greats play. You know, I, I got to go to the sound factory bar and hear little Louis Vega on Wednesday night. And I got to hear junior Vasquez at the sound factory and, um, I mean, there's another guy named Jonathan Peters who was an amazing DJ and I got to hear Danny Teneglia at Detour and like, I, I grew up and I feel very lucky to have grown up in the New York area, but living in Connecticut was a whole nother thing and DJing there. Right. Um, Were you DJing there from a young age? Uh, from like, I, I graduated high school and, and I pretty much went straight to DJing and, um, yeah, so like 12 years. Uh, I did Connecticut and um, I actually managed to um, create a, a little bit of a following uh, from, from being, being a DJ, uh, you know, it wasn't easy in Connecticut. Yeah, I can imagine. People care about most people just literally showed up because that's the place they're going to drink and that's the place they're going to hook up. Yeah. And so, you know, accepting that as your role, you're the basically the ringleader of people's drinking and hooking up endeavors. Right. <laughs> it, you know, that was one of the reasons why I chose to leave when I did. Um, sure. Well, I mean, that's a that's a thing, right? Is there's 
you know, in 12 years, it doesn't surprise me to hear that you built up a following and that you were known around town because I think anyone who sticks around long enough that long, you, that's that's what you deserve, assuming you're a good DJ, which you obviously are. But then I think there's also that danger, right, of staying too long. And right. I think we all know the people who have done that and you sort of, you get, for better or for worse, I, you know, I'm not putting a judgment on it, but people get this sort of local label that's yeah, just yeah, attached totally. to them and they can't escape it. Totally. And uh, did you feel, was that starting to happen? Was that a worry for you? I mean, I literally exited at the peak of my success. Um, mm. I had a show on like a, a radio show, a radio station, a 50,000 watt, like very powerful, listen, listen to radio sh station. Um, I was bringing guests to my club residency. Um, uh, I was do I was killing it. Yeah. By Connecticut standards. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and then I got this call in November of 1999 from a guy named Swedish Eagle and, um, Swedish Eagle is a legendary radio host in the Southern California. Yeah. Shout out to Swedish Eagle, man. I, I met him a few years back and did his radio show and, you know, I'd heard his name for so long. He's one of those guys that I think, uh, a lot of people who maybe just got into the scene in the last 10 years or so, they don't know who he is, right. but uh -huh. he's been so, so influential. Yeah. And, and like, you know, from, uh, first of all, he was a K-Rock, K-R-O-Q DJ in the eighties. And that was, you know, a very important station for the breaking of alternative dance music. And uh, then in the early 90s, he founded this thing called Mars FM in LA. It was the, America's first pure dance music station. Yeah, and, and this then, was back in the day, right? Uh huh. And then, like, some, yeah, this was like 93. Yeah, it was 93 to 96. And then 96 to 98, he did Groove Radio on the same frequency but it was a different owner he convinced two different radio owners to do this dance music format and then like one day you know it literally like came crashing to a halt and so uh he called me and he said you know i i love you doing his voice and dave I, I don't know if you know but uh groove radio is off the air and uh, we are going to come back as a as an internet radio station and i was like <laughs> internet radio He's like, you don't know it, but the internet radio is going to be the future. He, and he's <laughs> like, do you know how you how you hate Clear Channel and you hate all these companies that have these very tight playlists? Well, we're going to we're going to compete with them and we are going to blow them out of the water. Man, I mean, that's it's so funny because it sounds quaint now to talk about internet radio, but right. back then, I mean, that's visionary, man. It was it was visionary, and his partner was a guy named Bob Ezrin who, if you read credits of like, you know, like Pink Floyd albums and Kiss albums, he's the producer of these wow. records, right? So he was using his money that he made from producing to, uh, for a tech startup. Uh, and this was like, you know, you know, web 1.0 tech. Right. And so I was like, you know, it sounds interesting, Eagle. Um, why don't you um, fly me out there and yeah. let's talk about it. So he bought me a plane ticket and I flew to California and uh, I had a meeting and, and Bob Ezrin was there. And, I, you know, I'm like a, a crazy, like, credit reader. And so just to be in the room with this legend uh, was amazing. And then I, he asked me some questions what, about what I thought about, you know, radio and 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 where it could be going. And I, I gave him some answer that he liked. And he's like, he looked at Eagle and he said, get this guy, he's good. <laughs> Which probably was one of the greatest things that was ever said to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so, the dream, right? Is that someone actually just, that, that's what everyone wants is, you know, the hand that plucks you out of... Uh, totally. You know, yeah. And, you know, like you, one, you know, you get kissed by a prince and you're like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> you're you're now a Disney princess, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, then I had to go home and make the painstaking decision of whether or not to give up, th you know, a thousand dollars a week uh, playing in local clubs for the potential of being 
something greater than a local DJ. Sure. But that something was also undefined, right? I mean, it's leaving security and it's leaving a sure thing for a maybe not sure thing. So I went to my program director of the show that uh, the station that I had the radio show on. And uh, I, I explained to him Pete Tong. I said, there's a guy named Pete Tong. He's got a show on the radio, on the national radio station in England, every Friday night from 6 to 10 p.m. And he's using his a r skills and his radio skills and his DJing skills to, to come up with this amazing show of all the best new music in the week. And I want to be like him. And he said to me, well, do you think you could be Pete Tong in Hartford, Connecticut? And I said, probably not. <laughs> he said, well, then you need to get out of here. And you need to go do that because you're definitely going to be more in line to become Pete Tong if, you, uh, if you're in L.A. Right. And so my decision, that was the, my decision made. It was tough to like, I had to like sit with it for a few days because hard decision to make. Well, sure. I mean, if you've worked for 12 years to get to where you were at and you had a bunch of things going for you, man, I think... I think anyone can relate to that idea where you always kind of wonder if there's something else out there, if there's something more, you mm-hmm. know, where we end up is never exactly where we think we're going right. to be or uh-huh. where we dreamed of being, you know, before we got there. But man, le- actually leaving, that's hard to do. It, it was. And I was always holding out hope that, um, that like some label in New York would pluck me because of my great, amazing a r skills that I had no experience at, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it just never, it never really materialized. And like, you know, like all these a r jobs opened up and I would, you know, like apply to them and it didn't get, I didn't get hired. And, and then like after the 2001 terrorist attacks, record labels started laying off people in droves. Why was that? I don't even remember why. I think maybe because clubs, club venues had closed for a while. Yeah, I mean, there definitely was that period. uh, I mean, at least for a few months there where, yeah, it was it was almost like a game of chicken where nobody wanted to be the first one to say, you know, it's it's okay to have fun again. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, um, and literally 9-11 was the first day I worked with Josh Gabriel in the studio. Oh, man. And funnily enough, I, I, I don't know if you read this in my story, but um, Pete Tong was the one who played a role. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Um, well, when I went to work with Groove Radio, uh, one of the more, more, more amazing things about working there was that Swedish Eagle had these relationships with uh, amazing DJs. And when they play LA, they would come by to do a live mix on our, on our station. And one, uh, one time Pete Tong was coming to come. I had planned it for weeks. Like just like how I'm going to act when Pete Tong is there because he was like, my God. I mean, yeah. Well, and he, and not just you. I mean, at that time, I I think people know who Pete Tong is, but it's to give it the frame of reference. I mean, at that time in the, in the mid nineties, I mean, Pete Tong was like a God, you know, like the essential mixes, all of that. I I, I don't think you can overstate how influential that was at that time. The gods were, the gods were basically Pete Tong, Polo Confold, Carl Cox and Judge Jules. Those are the gods. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And so, um, uh, so he came by the station. I, I didn't do the interview. Eagle always did the interviews and occasionally he would ask me to join in. Right. Right. And so Pete, he asked, you know, he said to Pete, you know, you're one of the greatest ANR guys out there. You always know the hot new record that's coming out. What is hot for you? And Pete, Pete was like, I got three tunes, right? And I know two of them, and here's one that I don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> As a terrible Pete Tong impersonation. Yeah, that's pretty, it was better than I would have done, yeah. <laughs> um, so he pulls out this white label, and he was like, I just played in Seattle two nights ago, and the DJ, my, the opening DJ played this record, and I love it, and I don't know what it is. And I knew what it was. 
And so I politely entered the room and I, uh, when he was playing it, and I said, that is called I Want to Be You by Chocolate Puma. Mm. And he's like, really you know this tune and i'm like yeah yeah it's a jam you know and it's like i was like saying oh it's sampling climb the wall i knew all the like the history right. of everything about it right and he's like he said to me do you have any other um uh picks since you know so much about music <laughs> and i was like i'll tell you what i will make you a cd and i'll give it to you when you leave and so I made him a CD of the things. This was like when CD burning was brand new, state of the art, you know, blank CDs were like five bucks each. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so he left there with a CD of like 10, whatever I could fill on the CD picks of mine that I think would be great on the essential selection. And I put my phone number and my email on there. Mm. And so sure enough, the next week, three of the tracks from that CD were on the essential selection. I was like over the moon. It was just like, I've arrived. I'm going to be a star. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. So, um, he emailed me after the show and he said, the great choices, uh, I, I, um, do you have any more? And so, uh, he gave me his like DHL number and he's like, just fetch, you know, send him to me. And uh, we'll keep keep it going. This is when you couldn't really email right. music yet. Yeah, it's so funny to think about those yeah, days. There was no man. Dropbox. There was no we transfer. There was nothing. Yep. So I would make him a CD on Monday and FedEx it to him in England that he got by Wednesday or enough to get it on the radio. Yeah. And so every week there would be a couple of my selections on on the essential selection. And so... He emailed me like after three or four weeks of this. And he was like, you know, I really need somebody on the ground in America to find me some American talent. Mm. And it seems like you know what you're doing. And so I'd like to hire you as a scout for me. And I which, was like, kind of is that A&R job you were talking about. Yeah, right? So, yeah. yeah, totally. And so this was like just before Winter Music Conference uh, 2001. Right. And so I, I didn't have a mobile phone yet. And I was like, I'm going to get a mobile phone so I can be at Pete Tong's beck and call at, on my, in Miami. And I got a cell phone and I, I got all ready to go find talent in Miami. And lo and behold, um, the first night I'm in Miami that year, I met this guy at, at, at Giant, was a LA club that was hot at the time. And they had this thing called the Giant Hotel. Probably, you know, that was the first club brand hotel I'd ever seen in Miami. You know, oh, like sure. 10 years later, Avicii did it, but right. <laughs> Giant was first. And they brought in all kinds of people for this hotel. And one of them was my partner, Josh Gabriel who had a software project called Mixman. Um, it was like the first looping, loop-based uh, software. I think they had a maximum ability to, to handle eight, like three, uh, two bar loops. Sure, 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 yeah. So you could take these two bar loops and try to make a song out of it. <laughs> and But, it, you know, it was it was... It was it was a lot of people's first foray into producing, actually. Mm. Uh, and he he had made a controller with Mattel for it, and um, with Mattel, so, really? Yes, with Mattel. Oh wow! So I I met him in the lobby of that hotel the first night in Miami, and and I was actually way more interested in going out and either finding you know producers or hooking up with girls. Yeah, but. <laughs> I started talking to this guy and he was very entertaining and he was very uh, smart and he was very um, interesting. And so uh, I was like, uh, you know, this the software thing is really cool. You know, that's really a unique uh, thing. And I had, I knew nothing about production at this time. So sure. I was just like, but this seems like something I could mess with because I was a DJ. Right. And, so the next day, there was a pool party out on the, the roof of this hotel. And all, all these big DJs, I think Nick Warren was there, this guy named Leon Alexander, who ran a com company called Hope, was there. 
And during uh, Leon Alexander's set, me and Josh were standing there talking and he played Days Go By. Hmm. Was, was by uh, the Hydrogen Rockers, but then it, they became Dirty Vegas. And big tune, man. I mean, when That's that, again, tune. when people know that song, but when that came out, I mean, that was a big moment. It was a big tune. And it was, it was the, it was the song of the conference. Right. And, and he was like, excuse me, I got to go give him a record. And I was like, a record? He's like, yeah, he has my first 12 inch single. I'm handing it out at the conference. I was like, wait, you make music too? <laughs> Cause I was like tech, tech, you know, tech guy, you know, I thought he was a tech guy and right. he, he's like, yeah, I make music too. And he's like, I really want to like focus on my music pretty soon. And I was like, well, I, I'm a, I'm a scout for Pete Tong. Uh, maybe could you give me a copy? And, uh, and if, and, and if I like it, I'll give it to Pete and maybe he'll play it on the essential selection. And he looked at me and he's like, yeah, right. You know, Pete Tong. <laughs> I was like, no, seriously, I know Pete Tong, and I, I and I'm looking for music for him. Like, look, I, look at my, I looked, showed him my outgoing calls, and I showed Pete Tong on it. He's like, okay, I'll give you a record. And um, I was like, well, if you have a CD, I can go listen to it in my room right now and tell you what I think. And he's like, yeah, I got a CD. So I went down to my hotel room that had a CD player in it, and I listened to it, and I was like, damn, dude, you sampled OMD. That's a great sample. I'm going to give this to Pete. So lo and behold, I did give the record to Pete and Pete loved it. And he played it on his show and I made an instant friend. Right. And so like that was, you know, I was a liaison for Pete. Uh, but I also was like telling that Josh you know, how he could make his music better, um, more appropriate for DJ play. Hmm. And he's like, oh, these are really good suggestions. Maybe one day we should um, make music together and see how it goes. Had you considered that yourself before that no, time? I, I had tried it a few times with, um, with people who could, could, you know, engineer and play, play instruments. And I hated it. It was boring. <laughs> it was like, but this was when everything was hardware. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, it's a very different scenario than what it is today. But Josh was like, I have everything in the box. I sold all my gear and I'm doing everything in the box. And it's so much more liberating, so much more fun to make everything in the box. I was like, ah, I'm, I'd love to try it out. And so actually, like about three or four months later, Pete's like, you've been really, really working hard for me. And I can't pay you what you're worth, but I can give you um, a project that you could go find somebody to work with on. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe, you know, if it gets taken, we could pay, pay the, pay you for the remix. And I was like, well, what do you got? And he's like, well, I'm looking for remixes for this new order single that I'm doing the ANR for. Uh, how would you like to, how would you like to do a new order remix? And if we, you know, if we, if we accept it, we'll give you like five grand. Yeah. And I was like, new order. <laughs> I definitely want to do a new order remix. And I was just like, who can I reach out to? Who can, and he, wrote, he wrote back and he's like, why don't you ask Josh Gabriel? And so uh, that's, that's how Gabriel and Dresden started was a new order remix. Yeah, that's, I, that's really beautiful, man. I mean, I love that you introduced Josh to Pete Tong and kind of got him, you know, got him that shout out, that big up there. And then uh -huh. Pete turns around and kind of puts you guys back together. I, I want to, let's put a pin in that moment for a second, because when you were talking about New Order and the remix for New Order and your eyes kind of light up, uh, you mm -hmm. know, when you started, uh, even maybe before you started DJing, but when you were just a kid going to clubs in Connecticut and in New York, I, I just want to give people context because I think people don't necessarily understand the kind of music that was being played at that time, mm -hmm. why that music is influential to the music that we're talking about now totally. and sort of those, those connections there. I mean, what was, what was it like for you as a teenager going to a club in, in Connecticut or New York? I mean, what kind of music was there? What kind of a scene was it? Oh, the the club that I was able to go to when I discovered that the jocks didn't want to hang out with me 
<laughs> was that's a tough moment. Yeah, <laughs> the jocks. I w- went to one of the jocks parties in like tenth grade, and they're like, "Get out of here, nerd!" Like I literally got kicked out. It was really like that. Wow. It was literally like that. It was just like a movie. <laughs> and um, so I really wanted to find a way to meet girls, and. So there was, I heard about this club in Greenwich, Connecticut called the cafe and the cafe was a club in the top floor of a, of a classic church that was built in the 1700s. Oh, amazing. And Greenwich, Connecticut, give you context is one of the richest communities in America. Okay. So, so, so there's a, there's a nice, nice place, nice building. Yeah, historic. It, was nice place. It, it, was, yeah it was like, it literally was built in the 1700s. So it was just like amazingly gorgeous classic 1700s church um, that there was this music going on on Saturday nights from, from 6 to 10 p.m. And the DJ was a guy named Moby. Oh, yeah, I, I did. I did read that. And now you're reminding me that's that's wild, man. So this is this is what late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, it was like 86. OK, so Moby had not been Moby hadn't even gone to New York yet. He was still a local Connecticut DJ. Yeah, he was a local. Still, he's just a he guy a in local Connecticut. Connecticut DJ, and he was DJing every Saturday night in this. It was a juice bar. It, there was no alcohol. Um, it was in a church, so he definitely themed a lot of the music, gothy, you know, new wave style. I mean, I, I the first time I ever heard house music was from him, mm. and um, I just w- was so incredibly lucky to have this as my first foray into dance music coming out of speakers. And, and was it all underage? Is that why it was a juice all, bar? All yeah, kids? All underage. Basically, I think the limit was 18. Like you mm, couldn't yeah. be, you couldn't be 21 and go here. Yeah. So and you know, New Order was steadily on his playlist. He would probably play four or five New Order songs a night. So and that was always the biggest moments in his set was like Blue Monday or Bizarre Love Triangle or any of those records. And did you so, get to know him in those days? I did. He actually, I, I went up to him one night because I was just like, I could do this. I could, I could, you know, I could be the music selector in a room. And I was like, so, because I, I noticed him fiddling around with, he had a Vestax mixer. Oh, um, yeah. And I was like, I see you fiddling around, but I was like, I'm, I, I want to know a little bit more about it. Right. And he's like, here, I'm going to explain it to you right here. He's like, you hear how, if you count the fours, he, it, there's a rhythm to it. He's like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So what you have to do is you have to find records that are the same tempo, or you use this thing called a pitch control to yeah. change it to meet that tempo. But you have to count fours. That's uh, amazing. That, that That's amazing that he was just that open to tell a random kid how to DJ. I was a fixture there. So it was okay. like, you know, he, um, I wasn't just some stranger. Right. And he even like, it was like, you know, here's what you need to buy. And, you know, if you need any help, once you bought it, give me a call. And I was just like, I was actually too nervous to actually give him a call. <laughs> sure. Um, but um, one night he came to my first club gig and, I, and, and he was like, you still need a little practice. <laughs> <laughs> Let me remind you, he, he, he actually said that night, he's like, why don't you just take two copies of the same record and make sure and try to hold them down. Right. Uh, hold it down from the same spot. And you'll get the feeling of holding down a record. Mm. And that's how I learned how to DJ. That's how I learned how to mix. And he explained to me like that if you're phasing the records that you're a little bit off. Sure. Yeah. 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 And he's like, that can be a cool effect too. And this is before mixers had any of that stuff on it. So I, that was one of my like big tricks that I would do. (laughs) (laughs) Two copies of the same song. That's kind of cool, man. I I like that. Uh And and yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, give a little context for the people listening because I think, you know, I didn't start going to clubs until the mid nineties. And, uh, but you know, my understanding is the eighties, especially the late eighties. I mean, it's not only when dance music was being created, right. But it's, it's also when this really interesting mixing pot of 
pop music and new wave, like you said, and these all these different styles were sort of all dovetailing and coming together at the same time. Totally. And, but it was unclear sort of what was coming next. Yeah, it, was called, it was just called dance music. Right. All of it. It's just dance. There's no weird subgenres yet. Madonna was the same as Depeche Mode, was the same as New Order, was the same as Steve Silk Hurley. Right. Right. There was no like subgenres. There was no beat port. There was no nothing. The beat port <laughs> was actually physically going to New York every week and like hoping that you could get a copy. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the very few copies. Exactly. And, and those were usually like saved for, you know, any of the big DJs that would come in. And, and was, did I read too that you were also uh, doing some writing about dance music I at the did. same time? I, yeah, that was actually um, one of the ways that I wanted to show the record industry that I knew my shit. Was uh, and I actually had a talent for it too. I I um uh I, you know I barely graduated high school, but mm. English was always really a good subject for me. So I just started writing about music, and I would there was a there was a magazine that everybody read called Dance Music Authority, otherwise known as DMA. Right. Anybody in the '90s will remember it. But we're talking about you know a physical magazine. You go to yeah, the store, you buy magazine, the magazine in the yeah. mail. But the thing is, is it. The, literally the day everybody got it, you know, you get a phone call. Hey, man, that was an awesome review you did of that that record. I'm going to go get that record, you know, like stuff like that. It, You know, it was just like, you know, reaching people on Facebook, but sure. it was reaching people through a magazine. And then there was a number, number of other magazines. Uh, one of them still around called DJ Times. Sure, yeah. And there was another one called Mixer. Uh, which was the American version of Mixmag. And there was another one called Herb, which actually was a very, very popular like culture, uh, style culture magazine. Herb was, Herb was huge to me and to the people around me when I was coming up. And they, Herb was the first national press to give me any love. So I, yeah, I have yeah. strong, fond memories of Herb. Definitely. And I was inspired by Frankie Bones. Frankie Bones used to write in a magazine called Street Sounds. And like, I just loved the way he reviewed records. And like, um, so I just, I actually just wanted to be Frankie Bones. That's really what got me into writing. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's interesting because I think it's only now in 2020 that we're sort of getting back to that paradigm where you can do a whole bunch of different things and be accepted for that and, and have it be a positive rather than, I think, you know, even recently, five, 10 years ago, there was this mentality in the music industry that if you're an artist, you shouldn't distract people with any other things that you're doing. You know, you have right. to uh -huh. focus yeah, yeah. this Over. message. Yeah, overexposure. Sure. Yeah. Overexposure. Exactly. And, and I think now, and, and maybe the pandemic is part of this, I think we're finding out that people are actually a lot more open to artists doing kind of whatever they want, do it and doing a whole bunch of different things. And that I people are ready to accept that. actually gotten people a chance to actually get to know some of these artists through the live streaming and through the podcasting. And because, you know, a lot of people have pivoted. Yeah, and we're doing so many other things to to make money now, and I think that it, it's been people are just looking for things to distract them from the terrible world that we've got right now. Yeah, and um, and so you know, us artists are kind of leading the way in that way. Yeah, I think that's true, man. And I think it, it that's the thing. I think for artists. I, I mean, maybe this is self-centered, but certainly it's kind of for everybody. But for artists, especially, I think it's a it's a negative time in the sense that there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of what we relied on it has been taken away, et cetera, et cetera. But there is sort of in that free fall, I do think it, there's freedom in it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, well, I might as well try X, Y or Z because, you know, fuck it. What else am I doing? <laughs> exactly. That's. That's kind of what I thought back in March. I was like, I better do something because I'm going to go crazy if 
if I can't leave my house and I can't do something musical. Well, yeah. And so I, on that note, let, let's jump back to, you know, you meet Josh Gabriel and you form Gabriel and Dresden and you do, you know, these these remixes. You were sort of known as remixers first, right? Before you were known Definitely. for your original production. Yeah, we actually, it was a, a good year or, or more before we made an original. We, uh the thing is, is that I was using all the contacts that I had from the writing to get me remixes. Sure, um, because you you profiled a bunch of big people, right? And and made a bunch of connections through that, right? Yeah, like Paul Oakenfold and I, you know, we're, we were relative friends. Actually, Paul Oakenfold tried to steal me from Pete Tong. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's so funny. He called me. He's like, hey, I, I heard you're working with Pete. Oh, can I see if I could get you to do the same kind of work for me? <laughs> and then I was like, sure, I'll, I'll talk to you. But like in the end, it didn't really work out. But then when Pete started playing the re the Gabriel and Dresden remixes on the Essential Selection, Paul's like, oh, you're doing music now. Hey, here's a, here's a gin we're going to re release. You want to do a remix? <laughs> so that's how our Paul Oakenfold remix happened. And then Josh knew Tiesto. So Tiesto... Um, you know, asked us if we wanted to do a remix. And sure. it just sort of blossomed from there. And and also Nick Warren, you know, was also like a, a big supporter of our work and asked us to do a remix of a Way Out West song. And it, it just, I don't know, it was just crazy right time, right place, uncertainty in the world because of 9-11 that it just opened up. And I, I kept, I always joked back then, like everybody else is losing their job, but I'm blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, and it did, I mean, it happened once you guys got together and really started doing it, then things started to happen really quickly. Right. We were both very open-minded towards each other. Like it was so funny. Like I was in his studio one day, maybe a month or two into working with him. And I'm like, how the fuck did I even get here? Like <laughs> I've never been to San Francisco in my life. And now here I am every week working with this stranger on music. <laughs> and like, it just was so crazy that it all happened out that way. And I think that nine 11 actually played a role in it in that, like there was so much uncertainty in the world and we saw like, this is something that's working. Like, uh, you take a studio guy and a DJ guy and put them in a room together and this magic happens. Mm. And, um, and we just, we actually had no plan, uh, you know, in that going in, into that first remix to ever be a, a band. And we kind of like won each other over, like with the product. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, you know, it was just one, you know, one, one project led into the next project, led into the next project. And then all of a sudden we started getting phone calls Hey, we, we want a remix, but we need it by next Tuesday. And so like, then I started making emergency trips from LA to San Francisco to do, to work with him. And that's when we really started to feel like people are hiring us for this stuff. And this is when you got paid to remix. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's another thing I think people forget or don't know about. I mean, back in the day, yeah, you could, you could get paid really well just doing remixes. Yeah, I mean, the average, I'd say, you know, like what Pete Tong giving us five grand for that New Order remix was low ball. Right. That was just like, you know, here's some money for your time. But like, you know, like some of the other projects we had were like, there were five figures involved. Oh, sure. I mean, and the idea, even the idea of remix, you know, it was still kind of novel, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there was still so much potential for what a remix could do for a song or for a record label. Not that there isn't now, but I think now it's everyone just kind of knows what a remix is. And it's it's been devalued by the fact that it's just kind of old news, I think. Yeah, even though it, it can like, still blow up a song. Yeah, like, you know, Camel Fat remixing a pop act is always going to be something people are going to check out. Well, you guys were remixing pop acts back then, too, you know, just to, for more context, because I, I didn't realize you had done quite as much as you had. I mean, I've got a little list in front of me. I mean, Britney Spears, Depeche Mode, Evanescence, The Killers, a whole bunch of people that are outside of the dance music world. Yeah, definitely. It was, uh, it, it really was 
amazing. And what was what was interesting is that like Josh is actually very um he's very particular about the things that he works on and he has to love it. And it's just it was just interesting that like we got all these projects that he loved. Like um Annie Lennox. I mean it wasn't like a hit song by Annie Lennox, but just to work on an Annie Lennox vocal. Right. You know, to get those stems. Yeah, and just hear her raw voice and and just like oh, that's what a singer sounds like. And uh it was it was it was really fun. Probably I'd say that three years was probably the greatest three years I ever had when we did all those remixes. Cause and, and that's what, like early to mid 2000s, right? Yeah, it was like 2002 to 2004 or five. Yeah. Cause that's when after 2005 was when we actually really started to focus on our own, our own music and our own brand and all that stuff. Mm. And I mean, that time too, some of the people you've named, I mean, it was a big time for, for trance music and for progressive house and all of that as well. Right. I mean, at the same time, you guys are doing your thing. Oakenfold is, you know, huge, a million, there's a, I could name a million other people, but I, I think trance as a genre was really having a moment too. Right. Definitely. I mean, they're, they're the, the top 10 DJs and DJ mag were mostly trance acts and um, and getting played by these DJs had had a lot of meaning too. Does it have less meaning these days? Has it been? Uh, ha, has that those power that, centers been a little more decentralized at this point? You know, it's interesting with all the Shazam that's happening now. It is. It does seem like um, getting supported. Like back then, getting played by Tiesto was a was a massive thing and we got so many fans because Tiesto played our records. Right. And I just, I'm, I'm not, I actually am not sure because you know, we're, we're not like an act that gets played by the, the big DJs anymore. Cause we don't make that <laughs> kind of music. Sure. Sure. Well, I mean, you guys have always sort of just sounded like yourselves, if you know uh -huh. what I mean. Yes, definitely. Not, not that, not that the music doesn't fit in. And I think it fits in now kind of as well as it did at, at any moment, but I think it always just sort of sounded like you. Like, yes. uh -huh. And actually it makes me wonder now that I'm saying it, you know, in those early days, was there, were you guys trying to, to fit in with a sound or a scene or a style? Like what, you know, what was the, what we, were the building blocks of that inspiration to sort well, of we develop were, what became your sound? We weren't. Like, actually, what's interesting is that before we actually started DJing together, we never thought anything about the tempo. Um, we were just like, what tempo does this vocal sound good at? And that's where we would set the tempo for the remix. So, you know, occasionally the tempo of the song dictated the tempo of the remix. But we never thought about that until we started DJing. And then we started knowing what 128 meant and what 132 meant and what 135 meant. And it still wasn't like the tempo. Like back then, the trance that everybody was playing was 140. And, and, the, and then deep music was 130. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the first Aunt Juna Deep records are 130, 132. So, um, you know, that was deep compared to 140. Right, right. Yeah, the so, definitions have definitely changed over time. But once we started DJing together in 2003, that's when um, we started to pay more attention to the, the DJ ability of our records. Um, and we always were like, you know, make sure that the first, you know, 16 bars, the last 16 bars have no tone in them. Right. Um, that was definitely one of the things that I was like a stickler about from the beginning. I was like, <laughs> you gotta give it the intro and the outro. Insanely programmable. Right. <laughs> nothing pisses me off more when a song starts with synths. <laughs> well, yeah, which is funny these days because I think having that on your record, the, the intro and the outro, so that other DJs can play it. I think that's much less of a thing now. I think it's sort of gone back to what it used to be, mainly because of the streaming paradigm where, right. you know, uh, on Spotify, if your song starts out with 30 seconds of drums, mm -hmm. you know, nobody right. wants that, basically. Totally. 
Um, well, that's, I, you know, the radio edit is more important than ever now. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these records back then didn't get them. And now every song has an edit and to, so that it can get played on Spotify and, and, uh, and end up in playlists. And it's so funny, man, because it really is changing. I was talking to, uh, to Lane 8 about that. And, you know, he makes these beautiful, like, eight, nine minute progress journeys of songs yes. and then he's, he was talking he's about one that does not do the dj in and out well yeah for sure but then he was talking about you know he has to at a certain point and who else i think spencer brown was talking about this too where you know at a certain point if you have a single you got to play the game and so he was talking about just sort of the absurdity of trying to take this eight minute journey of a song and just oh, chop yeah. it into a three minute yeah you know, Spencer hates edits. Spencer, <laughs> Spencer was like it was funny like on his last album they literally said you're making an edit of one of the songs and and when he did it I called him up I'm like I'm proud of you I'm really proud of you. I know how hard that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in this period, the, the period you're talking about, these five years where everything just starts going into hyperspeed, you guys become known as, as an artist, as a group, not just as, you know, remixers or producers or DJs. But, you know, that experience for you starting to to have fans, to play shows every weekend, to tour, to have a different lifestyle. What was that like? Was it was it fun and exciting? Did it feel like finally this is what I've been looking for? Or was it was it odd? It was everything. It was yeah. like I it's everything that I had already dreamed of. I had all my big dream when I had seen what Moby was doing in the early 90s of touring, you know, going to England every weekend. I was like, how the fuck do you do that? He's like, I just put my, I just fall asleep on the plane and I arrive there and I, and I go to the gig and I do it and I come home. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I'm so jealous. I want to tour the world and see the world and play music. And so it was just like every day I woke up pinching myself. I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe I get to do this. Um, but at the same time, it was also really hard because I had never traveled like that before. And then you're traveling for these crazy long hours and then you're expected to be the greatest you've ever been. <laughs> so and that took a lot of getting used to. I mean, we were literally thrust into uh, success. We had right. the two years. And then when we first started doing gigs, we, we ended up on the DJ Mag chart. We debuted at like number 42, the highest new entry of the year. Mm. after six DJ gigs, it was just because <laughs> of the, the songs that year that we had made that, that, that sort of like, yeah, you had some hits early on. Yeah, we had, a, we had a hit called as the rush comes by motorcycle. And so it went, we went from like remixers to these stars literally overnight. Like, you know, like there's a lot of, you know, overnight sensation, you know, like IO was an overnight sensation. Like he literally like came out with his first tracks and then he's selling out rooms. Sure. Well, and it, it's funny though, man, because hearing you say that at, in the context of what we've just talked about, I mean, you were, you were talking about you DJed in Connecticut for 12 years, you know, and you were laying all these bricks. Mm -hmm. I always, the, the idea of an overnight success is always just funny to me because it's the same with, with IO. Like the one time I got to have him on this show and, and which was actually the first time I met him, it was the mm -hmm. same thing where he had projects that failed before that and he had been trying for so long. And then finally, sort of like what you said earlier, he hit that sweet spot, the right time, the right idea, the right uh -huh. moment. And, and he had and the just, talent. That's the thing. He just, yeah. he actually, I mean, listening to the Faux project, you could see that he was like trying to be everything for everybody. And then it seemed like with IO, he wanted to create one thing for what he wanted to do. And that was techno. Well, and that's that, that, that's that fuck it moment again, right? Where yep. you tried and it didn't work and you're frustrated and you don't have anything else going on. So you might as well just go hard on the thing you're really passionate about, right? Totally. And, and, and it worked and that's exactly what happened for us. And, um, I, you know, the, the following four or five years were amazing, but also very painful too, because we became a little bit of the classic, you know, touring story of like over, overextending ourselves, 
going to too many after parties, maybe a little bit too much partying. And that's what sort of led us to our demise, actually. Well, yeah, man. I mean, success, I, I, I talk about this all the time. Success puts such a heavy strain on whatever you've got going on. So if there's totally. if there's any little chinks in the armor, if there's any little, you know, emotional issue going on, whatever, you know, everybody's got something. And so whatever oh. that is, it's only going to get magnified a thousandfold and or more, depending on how successful you are, right? Yeah, Mo Money, Mo Problems is actually <laughs> so spot on of yeah. a record. Because it's true. The more money you're making, the more problems you, you, you've inherited. Didn't I see, a uh, side note, didn't I see that you also uh, did a profile on Diddy at one point while you were writing? I did. Well, were you with him? Did you talk to I, him? Yeah, yeah I, I met him in the Arista offices in New York. Um, and and I had lined up an, a, 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 a notorious B.I.G. interview, too, that I was going to uh, do at the same place, just literally a, a week before he was killed. Wow. Wow. That's wild. I, I was always into um, A&R guys that had their shit together. And when well, Diddy, I mean, he was an A&R guy, right? At, at his yeah. core. Totally. He he had Uptown Records. Um, and he found Mary J. Blige and he found, um, uh, Jodeci and he found all these artists that like, that were huge game changing artists. And what was it um, like? Do you, do you have memories from talking to him for that piece you wrote about I him? I do. And in fact, was it interesting was he was talking, I mean, he wanted to talk about house music mm. and he, told me, he's like, I go to the sound factory as much as I can to hear Junior play because I love it. And I like go on the speaker and I just lose myself in the music. And I just loved hearing that about from him because yeah. it was not something I expected to hear from him. And, and I understood too, because I went, went there too. And because the sound in that room was just unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, and, well, and and he, I mean, now I think it's pretty well known that he loves house music and, you know, he throws these, you know, 24 hour parties that's just him dancing to house all night. Everybody's uh -huh. wearing white, et cetera. But especially back then, I think it's cool that he would even talk about it because, you know, he had the image of sort of this super hard New York dude putting out, you know, the, the biggest rap records. Totally. And, and but he he told me house music was a huge influence on his hip hop music. Just the, the structures of the of the arrangements and all this stuff. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's that's actually really interesting to think about back then to put yeah, all it was that no in surprise context. when he would when he did when he ended up working with um Marillo and um and Deep Dish uh on 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 his house music project. Yeah. Well, even even his big, you know, his big rap records, the samples he was picking, I mean, those could have been in house songs and they were party records. You know, I think that's that's part of his success when he had that crazy run in the 90s and the 2000s was, you know, he was just making records that would work in any club in any party like they could have been played next to a house music song or they could have been played next to the hardest rap song his sample choices were always spot on yeah and, and i remember at, at one point it was all uh it was all um nile rogers productions which and was, was before everybody else sort of figured out that you really should be looking to Nile Rogers. Yeah. Well, we actually, in that interview that it was on the internet for a long time on about.com until about.com went, went bust. All my interviews were up there. Mm -hmm. um, I actually wish that there was a way I could see this interview again, because we talked about how, you know, how we talked about how great Nile Rogers was in this interview. It was a great interview. I was very wow. proud of that interview. Man, there's got to be, it's got to be somewhere. You don't have copies or anything? Mm, that was, you know, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long time ago. It was like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't keep any like physical things on my hard drive because I knew they were on the internet. I had a Daft Punk interview, one of the rare Daft Punk interviews. Oh, well, that's even crazier. It had millions of views. And, um, uh, but when about.com went bust and all their, it, it, it went away and yeah. I, I wasn't planning for that. So I have no <laughs> right. of it. Man. So, 
Man, it's got to exist. I feel like somewhere in the world it exists. I don't know how you'd ever find it, but it's got to be somewhere. Maybe I'll send out a tweet. Does anybody have my old interviews from the 90s? <laughs> I bet somebody does, man. It might be worth it. <laughs> There's actually this one fan in Connecticut that has everything I've ever done. Copies of my radio shows and DJ mixes on the internet. And he, he might have them. Yeah, that's cool, man. I love it when people catalog everything like that because it's just, I don't know, the, I, I don't have the brain to do that. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah, uh, I wish I did. <laughs> I wish but, I did too because then I would I would definitely have way more music on my hard drive than I do. <laughs> I have this one hard drive that I've been copying over since 2000 and some of my music is on there but some of it had it did you know it was on other hard drives that i didn't copy or right <laughs> things failed and like that's really I funny didn't feel like dealing with it yeah i mean i get it man if it works why not keep doing it which yeah. actually okay so on that note you had mentioned, you know, you had this sort of warp speed five years where all of a sudden everything flipped for you guys. You were these hot artists, number one hits, making best DJ lists, all that. And then you guys split up uh, sort of at the height of that, right? I mean, it's it while you were... We, yeah. accepted, we accepted the, um, the award at the Winter Music Conference. What do they call those things? Um it was like the what best DJ? I, yeah, IDMA. We 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 accepted the best American DJ award, right? And then literally the next morning, it's like all the blogs that existed at that time um, were like Gabriel and Dresden accept award, then break up. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we had our final show that night, and um, and it was packed, lined down the down, down the road. Uh, it, to get in. Um, was it announced that it was your final show? It was, it was, it was, um, leaked. Yeah. We didn't announce it. We, we didn't want to announce it until after the conference, but it was leaked. And, uh, I actually have some theories on who leaked it, but, um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think that speaks to how big you guys were at the time was even that, that somebody would leak that information. Yes. You know? Exactly. There's no, there's no data out there that can't be told by somebody, <laughs> um, maybe even for a price. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we announced, uh, our, we ended up announcing our split at the winter music conference and there was crying and it was like, I can't believe you guys are going to break up. And like, it was just, it was, you know, probably the worst time in my life. Well, it's hard for people to understand just in general and, and for anybody. I mean, I've gone through it with groups I loved as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how could they break up when they, they're they making, you know, this this music that means so much to me and they're doing so well in their career? It's like they're doing what I would want to be doing. How could they stop, you know? What we didn't do was we didn't pace ourselves. We just literally nonstop from 2001 to 2008 worked every day in day in day out on music together. And we were just sick of each other. Yep. And that's really what it was boiled down to is that we just wanted a break. Well, and it's, yeah, because you've had to form a friendship while you were also forming your career, right? It wasn't uh -huh. like you had all this history before Gabriel and Dresden started. Definitely. Whatever this means to you, whatever memories it brings up, I mean, talk about, you know, the I, coming to that point of saying we got to stop this while it's so successful. I think that's got to be a super hard thing to do, even if you know it's good for you, even if you know you can't keep on. It's got to well, be very frustrating when things are going well in the career and you worked so hard to get there. It, it was frustrating, but there was definitely some serious problems happening that I needed to personally deal with and Josh needed to personally deal with that was getting in the way of us being a band. And um, we were at a point where like, we were arguing about everything about a song and not, it just didn't feel right. It was like, it felt toxic. Sure, it's an argument. Of, so, you know, argument about a song that's really an argument about something else, right? Right, and we had, 
we always had this ability to, um, to before um, sort it out. And during this period of time, we just had, didn't have the tools we needed to sort through the problems we had. And so it seemed like the right thing to do. Now, I mean, we probably could have actually said, hey, let's just take a step back here for a second. Maybe just take a few months off, do other things that we want to do, and then regroup and figure it out. Um, but there were a couple of factions that were also like people in our ears, in both of our ears. Sure. Also telling us things. And it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Well, yeah. And I mean, that's another thing, right? Is it's not just you guys. Once the success and the money comes in, then people, you know, then you're making money for other people too. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of people that are either relying on you or just invested in what you're producing. And so nobody, nobody wants to stop that machine. Definitely. And I mean, you know, like the Beachy documentary is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Um, that like, you know, there were so many livelihoods um, on top of, you know, his career that would have been affected if he had stopped touring and he had to make the choice that was right for him. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's what we did. We made the choice that was right for us at the time. You know, in hindsight, it was probably one of the worst business decisions in the <laughs> history of dance music. But, <laughs> um but it had to be done, right? And, and, you know, three years later, you guys reunited and you, you've you had this whole second run that mm-hmm. has been really, really interesting. What was it like, not to sort of gloss over that period in between, because I know you both, you know, sort of did solo projects and worked on other things and evolved as artists and people. But, you know, that process of reconciliation and coming back together, what, what was that like? I mean, was there... The reconciliation process was like, it was one of those things that sort of happened organically, like our coming together. Um, Each year, that club giant would give us an offer to play their New Year's party in LA. Mm -hmm. And the number just kept going higher. (laughs) To the point where it would, we are ridiculously stupid if we turn this down. (laughs) Right. I don't even want to say it. It's I'm actually embarrassed by the amount of money we made that night. But <laughs> we were like, we can't hate each other that much that we turn this offer down, right? <laughs> right like yeah. I agree. And we weren't sure what it was going to feel like. So the day before the gig, we finally got together to talk about the show and what we were going to play. And we got that magic feeling that we used to get going over records. You know, like Josh would play his picks. And I was like, man, you got such good taste in music. And like, and then he would like, you know, hear the things that I was playing. And he, he, we just had always knew what was right for the DJ set. And I think that we both went out of that meeting thinking that the magic is in Gabriel and Dresden. Like just the way that we came to, to put this reunite uh, uh, set together uh, just felt right. And from what happened that night, like literally by the time, you know, like Monday morning came along, uh, our booking agents had like multiple offers for us to do a reunion show for them. Oh, wow. And like, it, it, again, it was a sort of a thing where we were like, we'd be idiots to throw this, you know, to, 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 you know, to take all this money off the table that, that we're being offered. Sure. I mean, but sure. I that, that was a, another veiled way of saying, I really enjoyed going over with music with you and DJing with you the other night. Yeah. I was about to say, I feel like the money was probably just a, a convenient way to sidestep the fact that maybe enough time had elapsed that you could both, appreciate what you had actually built together right totally and it was funny like we we re-entered the dance music industry and it was a totally different beast i mean that's crazy too right from what 20 2008 to 2011 a lot changed a lot changed i mean the festivals 
were the, you know, were starting to become the, the big thing. And, you know, uh, Swedish House Mafia and Dead Mouse and Avicii and all these new acts that weren't really anything when we broke up were now, you know, commanding way more money than even we were when we were successful. Certain sure, new sounds and new styles becoming popular. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, we got this one year. The 2011 was the year that they sort of treated us like we were those guys. <laughs> and and then it was just like no no you're old you're you know you you, you need to make music every, you need to be releasing music every week is what somebody told me wow and um and I, we just tried we tried to make this you know this big room music that everybody else was making and it just it felt like two guys trying to make music sure and well, so, that's that we we talked about that earlier, right? Is when you started and people latched on to you, you weren't chasing a particular sound, right? right. And yeah. we were literally chasing a sound. You know, we were using vengeance drum packs and things that were just not, you know, like part of our music making process. And right. you know, there were A and R guys in our ears saying, you know, you, you need to get with some new sounds and like you need to accept the new sounds that are happening. Um, which is why in like 2014, 2015, we decided to not make music for a while, hmm. which really kind of went until 2017 when we uh, finally did a Kickstarter to fund the making of a new album that got signed to Anjuna Beats. Right. And, and you know, since then, the, the new album as well, Remedy, also on Anjuna, also kickstarted, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and t talk a little bit about the idea to to use a Kickstarter to to fund the making of an album. I mean, had you guys just sort of you came back, you sort of tried the the new thing, you tried to you know do maybe what you thought people wanted or, or who's somebody in your ear. It didn't exactly go the way you wanted it. Was mm -hmm. it just sort of frustration and just say, was it another fuck it moment where it's just, well, let's just do what we like to do? Here's what happened is Tony McGinnis from Above and Beyond called me one day randomly. And he was like, I'm driving through London right now, listening to your debut album. And when can we get another one? Your debut album is one of the greatest albums of all time. He said to me, and I was blown away. Like I knew that they liked that album, but I didn't know that it was one of the greatest albums of all time. <laughs> yeah, that's big. And so he's like, what's it going to take for you guys to be able to make a, another album? And I said, I, I actually was, I thought I was being kind of funny. And I said, funding, <laughs> you know, cause I was kind of like, you know, make an offer, give us, sign us, you know, like, I don't know what you want right. an album, you know, make it happen. Right. And um, I thought, of, I literally thought about that for two years. And like, I thought about Kickstarter and I, I mentioned it to Josh a couple of times and like, you know, we can't do that. People are going to laugh at us, you know? Um, but then I saw, um, uh, I can't think of her name right now. The girl from the Dresden Dolls. She had a, a, a video, um, Oh, uh, Palmer. Uh, yeah, Amanda Palmer. Amanda Palmer, yeah. Yeah, she had a TED Talk called The Art of Asking. And she, I think she made a book of the same thing. And it talked about how her fans wanted to lift her up. And I like was really inspired by this. And I showed it to Josh, who loved TED Talks. Like Josh used to bore me with TED Talks in the hotel room. <laughs> like, oh, we're going to have to watch another TED Talk, right? Right. So here I am giving Josh a TED talk. He needed to let it sit for a little while. Like, so like literally a month later, he calls me up and he's like, he had, he was at, um, in Amsterdam at the Dan Amsterdam dance event. And he had this moment, this epiphany moment, like, all right, I figured it out. We're going to make a trance album and we're going to use Kickstarter and it's going to be great. And I was like, <laughs> all right, let's do this. And we literally did it. Like we just went and did it. Like we were not going to let our fears get in the way of being creative and being an artist and being a band. Well, cause that, and fear is part of it, right? I think, 
I think that's a big reason actually why more people don't do something like that is that you there's this weird fear or anxiety that if you do something like start a Kickstarter or go directly to your fans and say, I want money for this project, there's a weird thing that, and it's not true, it's false, that if if you present yourself that way, that it somehow sort of diminishes like your you success. as an artist or your success or that you're no longer, that you can't project this image anymore. It's all this weird bullshit, but I think a lot of people are kind of hamstrung by it. Well, I mean, my booking agent um, told me, you have to be bigger than you are, always. And you have to present yourself like you, you know, don't lower yourself to like, I don't know, responding to DMs and like um, a whole bunch of yeah. things were wrong. Yeah. That's why she's not my booking agent anymore. <laughs> but that stuck with me for a long time that like if we did a Kickstarter, that would admit that we're not these millionaires, right. you know, untouchable artists that are just better than you, you know? And I'm really glad we did that because it actually made us a lot more down to earth. Um, and it also brought us closer to our fans um, who felt like, you know, we didn't know we were going to get signed to Anjuna Beats. But when we got signed to Anjuna Beats, they, they were like, wow, we funded a thing that got on Anjuna Beats. You know, it was like right. people were really incredibly proud to be a part of that. Yeah. And that's, it's a special thing that you can share with, you know, with the real core, the real uh -huh. people, not, not that there aren't thousands of other people who maybe didn't contribute to this Kickstarter that also love what you do, but the people who did, I mean, that's, that's a core of people. That's a community that you've shared this experience with. Right. And honestly, I believe that this Kickstarter community is what really gave us the groundswell of success in the streaming world mm. is that these people were already activated and motivated to support us once again in a direct to fan situation. Right. Yeah. Which is exactly what, what the streaming situation is. And, and again, I mean, the club quarantine thing that you guys have been doing just for anybody listening who doesn't know, I mean, it started off, you were playing every single night, right? The first, the first 15 shows were 15 days. <laughs> yeah. Um, every night, just play it. Every night. It was just, I and long you know, sets, right? Long. I would go, I just, I did not want to deal with reality. It was too, it was too hard for me to deal with reality. And so being able to be people's entertainment helped me too. Right. And until like, you know, everybody's like, you got to take a break. You need a you need a night off. And then like I was like, okay, well let's let's limit it to four times a week, you know? Yeah, which and, is still crazy. Yeah, it was just still crazy. Now it's three times a week. I just took a month break off. How um, how was that? Was you amazing. don't seem like someone who's good at taking breaks. No, I'm not. I, <laughs> I uh, I'm a workaholic and I love I love my job. I just I I, I fiend for it. Yeah. I loved the flow of what I, of, of what I created, like that, like, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, my weekend is covered. Right. Playing. Right. And then, you know, Tuesday, I get to do it again. Um, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man, to see, you know, somebody like you with the career that you've had up to this point, still be so in love with what you're doing and so passionate about it. Do you, do you think, like, if you look back, is there something you figured out along the way or something you did, or is it just something about who you are as a person that you're able to still have this much passion and love for the game this far in? Because I, I know a lot of people who have just had a lot of success, but you just burned out or gotten jaded. You know, what, what is it that you've been doing? It wasn't always this way. In fact, there was a good chunk of the 2010s that I didn't pay attention, that I didn't care, that going on Beatport was painful, that um, I didn't love the music. I wasn't finding the music that, that inspired me. That I mean, it, it turns out that I wasn't 
you know, I, I was just wasn't right. I wasn't ready. I wasn't right in the head for it. Um, and like, I've come back to this area of falling in love with the music from all the moves that I've made from the Kickstarter and the signing with Anjuna and the, you know, starting the stream. These are things that have brought me, reeled me back into like caring and, 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 you know, and there's just an, an amazing abundance of great music now. Yeah. And great artists. Um, well, and I mean, I, you know, I was listening to the Remedy album again yesterday. And again, it's what I was saying earlier. It, it just sounds like you guys. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I mean, it didn't, I didn't have a reference for it in terms of other current artists. I mean, it didn't sound like anybody else. I don't know. It, it almost sounded like what you've always been good at, which is sort of this mix between progressive dance music. There's these sort of pop elements but not current pop you know it's like not almost over. these what'd you say 80s pop. yeah 80s pop and like these classic influences mm -hmm. and nice. uh, yeah I, I just really liked it man there's like a there's a it's it was kind of dark in a way that a lot of dance music isn't right now josh and i are dark people like <laughs> we just are i mean but but again, I think there's lots of people in dance music right now that you would say, oh, they, they, they make dark music or they would say, you know, yeah, my music's really dark. But I think the darkness that you guys have, I mean, again, it's that classic darkness. Uh -huh. It's it also not has like light too. It's yeah. like it's light and dark. Sure, and of course. The balance between major and minor chords. And um, I, I'm just incredibly lucky that I get to work with a guy who has who's in tune with who's in tune with his emotions mm. um and so we can really hone in on um that sound that we make and you know we we wear our influences on our sleeve and always have i mean the cure will always play a role in our music depeche mode will always play a role in our music um you know soft cell will always play a role in our music Human League, you know, a lot of classic 80s music. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's beautiful, man. I, I really like that album. That uh, Coming On Strong, uh, I played that track over a couple times. And to me, it was out of time in a good way. Like, yes. I, couldn't, I couldn't just place it in an era. And I really liked that. Timelessness for us is, like, one of the most important things. Like, when, you know, when there's a new production thing that everybody's jumping on, that's usually what, you know, and I'll, I'll show you, Hey dude, you hear this new thing? That was like, Oh dude, that just sounds like 2010, you know, or whatever right. year we're in. I remember when everybody was using like the bit crusher on that things. And he was just like, that's just going to time stamp this to 2006. Right. And, and I owe, I owe a lot of that to Josh that he really keeps us from, from using any trendy elements in our music. I mean, yeah, it seems like at this point, after such a long career, you guys have really figured out sort of how to complement each other and how to fill in the gaps that the other person has. And, you know, you were talking about somebody with Josh as somebody with a lot of emotional intelligence. Uh -huh. Was there a moment when you guys got back together? I mean, did you did you do any of that like Metallica documentary, like go to a therapist? Did you have those conversations about, you know, sort of evolving well, the personal relationship next to the professional? Well, I'm going to I'm going to say a kind of a controversial thing that I did that my dad inspired me to do that I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but it was a catalyst. And about the time that I showed Josh that Art of Asking TED Talk, I also went to the Landmark Forum, which is a, um, some people call it a cult. Okay. And um, it's basically three 14-hour days in a row that you are in an auditorium listening to speakers and listening to audience participants coming up on stage and telling their truths. Interesting. And um, there's a lot of like 
them trying to sell you on bringing your friends and family to these things so that they would also go through this thing. Sure. I tuned all that shit out. I was really only talking, paying attention to the personal growth stories that I heard. And like, where can I own some of my shit as it relates to Josh Gabriel? Sure. So I, like, after it was done, I called him up and I was like, hey, man, you know, we never really talked about the breakup and what happened for the break, you know, the cause of the breakup. And, and what are my things that I need to apologize to you for? And that's literally where... You know, Josh needed to sit on it for a little while. And then like I got the call because it was it was September 2016 that I had done this. And Amsterdam Dance Event is in October. Sure. Well, and this is so that's years after you had gotten back together. Yes, it was years. Like we were actually like uh, that was part of like why we weren't successful is that we kind of, you know, we weren't comfortable around each other. Right. And like, we really needed this landmark forum experience that, you know, I don't really ever tell anybody to go to the landmark forum because I don't think that they're going to have the experience that I had there. They're probably going to get put off by the, the amount of trying to sell you on <laughs> getting your friends to come. <laughs> but I really got so much out of that. And it really is the catalyst for our 3.0 success. Right. And that's really where, it, it, you know, if, if, if you are in a band and you're having problems, you guys just need to sit down and talk about it and be honest. And like maybe even watch some kind of monster. Um, with the yeah, Metallica the Metallica doc. Yeah. Um, and it was actually a very successful act that I've been talking to Um they're having some problems some inter internal problems. Actually COVID has given them a chance to like really take a break and like from each other. Yeah. And I, I told this person about my experience and like what maybe they could do to like, because any, any act that has more than one member in it has internal conflict. Yeah. No matter what they, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no matter what it on looks the like yeah so um it's just about being honest with each other in the end and uh and hearing hearing out the problems and trying to remedy them well and the fact that you came to it you know and this is true i think it, it goes beyond just artist groups and bands i mean it's it's any relationship that you came to it saying okay before we start I know I did these things wrong and right. opening uh, it that way. I think, I mean, that's just, that that's just smart relationships, man. That could apply to any relationship you have with anybody. Definitely. And I mean, it's definitely, it definitely helped here. And, um, I owe a lot of our current success to it. What does the future look like for you guys? Because I mean, you've done these, these two very successful kick-started albums. You've worked with Anjuna that seems to be a flourishing relationship. You're doing these crazy club quarantine streams during this time. You know, have you thought about what it looks like for Gabriel and Dresden once things start to, you know, get back to normal? Well, Josh is a guy who needs to change his studio every few years. Like, you know, when I first got together with him, he had sold all his gear and he's all in the box. Um, now we're at a point where Josh needs a new setup. And Josh being happy and inspired is so important to the future of our music. And so Josh has, like, been really paying attention to, like, getting modules that he wants to make a rig that he wants to use every day. Sure. And so that's where we're at right now, getting Josh's rig. That that's cool, man. I, I know a lot of other artists who this year, last, last year too, really started getting heavy into the modular stuff. And it really, some friends of mine, super talented people who kind of lost that spark, it kind of uh -huh. gave it back to them. 
Right. And Josh has been dreaming out of modular for years. Um, and I've seen him use them before. A friend of ours bought, uh, built a six oscillator Moog modular. And six oscillators in synthesis is a lot of fucking sound. Yeah, you can do a lot. So um, we made two songs on a modular synthesizer. Right. And it was probably the two most fun things we've made in our career. And he's really into all these like little um, Euro rack mod modules. So that's what we're building right now. And, um, you know, it's like, we're kind of like a little weirded out by releasing music right now because it's like doing a live performance where maybe there's nobody in the attendance. Sure. <laughs> well, not to mention, I mean, you did put out an album this year, you know. Yes, we did. And yeah. I mean, it didn't unfortunately do as good as The Only Road. And I believe it's because, you know, the world shut down like literally a month later. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's so much uncertainty. You're trying to chart out a way to, you know, to put out an album. There's like established ways. There's things that happen when you put out an album and all of that got thrown out the window for sure. Not just the touring, but everything. And, and the touring is, you know, I feel like, you know, playing to clubs of between 500 and a thousand people twice a weekend for, you know, six months is going to get more people listening to your music. Of and course. We, we, we lost that. And I thought maybe the stream would have some effect on it, but it didn't. Uh, or maybe it did. Maybe like it would have been way worse if, had I not done the stream. But it's, Who knows, man. But yeah, I mean, I think the stream keeps you connected to the people who care about what you do, you know, even uh -huh. if it's not necessarily bringing in a shitload of new people. And maybe it is, I have no idea, but I, I think... It brought in it, a lot of new fans. That yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, that, that we kind of tapped into the Anjuna world with this stream. It's sort of become like another group therapy. Right. Um, but beginning back to the music, I feel like there's no urgency to get this sorted right now and be ready to release music. So I, you know, the stream is bringing in money. When we're ready, we're going to use this module, module modular synthesizer. Josh is just, he's working at his pace to get it together. Yeah. And it's, it's working out great. And I, I'm actually really excited that he's inspired. And like, I'm, I've been to musical gym, like the DJing that I've done this year is my musical gym. I, yeah, you've been pumping that iron, man. I definitely am ready with, I know arrangements. I know like, I've been paying attention to the drum sounds of all these records and like, what do I like and what, what do I not like? And what's really inspiring to me. So well, this this has been great, man. Is, do you feel like is there anything else we haven't talked about? I, anything that's that everything on? that I need to say? Okay, great. <laughs> I did everything that I needed to do. Awesome, man. Well, it was great yeah. to talk to you and actually, like, you know, go over some of these things I haven't talked about in a while. Dude, it's been great to talk to you too. I'm glad we've been talking about it for forever. So I'm glad we finally made it happen. Hell yeah! Yeah, awesome. man. Yeah, I'm really glad that that we were able to do this. All right, man. All right. Great to talk to you. All right, you too. All right, bye. All right. that's the show shout out to dave great to have you on the show man shout out to gabriel and dresden that was awesome i hope everybody out there enjoyed that as much as i did don't forget gabriel and dresden just dropped their 20 years of anjuna beats compilation a retrospective on the last 20 years of the legendary label their newest album remedy is out right now also on anjuna beats and there's going to be a link in the description of this episode where you can go grab the album grab the compilation and follow gabriel and dresden keep up to date with them watch their club quarantine streams. All of that is in the link. My name is Willie Joy. You can follow me as well at Willie Joy or at Back to Back Pod on all social media. Also in the description, you'll find a link where you can come join the Back to Back Discord. Come on in there. Come chat with me. You've heard me talk about it before. If you make music, come and share it. Get some feedback. Meet some other like-minded producers. And just in general, just 
come hang out with us, man. We're a good group. What else are you doing? What do you got to lose? Come join the Discord. All right, so look, that's it for this week. The team went crazy this week uh, doing some outreach, reaching out to some new guests, people we haven't had on before. We're going to see what comes back from that, but I'm pretty excited with some of the names that are being thrown around right now. Uh, Look, I hope you, you the listener, you hearing my voice right now, I hope you are doing well. I hope you're safe and healthy and happy. I hope 2021 is starting off on a good foot for you. And I hope, you know, whatever you're working on, whatever you're trying to accomplish, uh, I'm sending you support. I'm sending you good luck. I'm sending you good thoughts in general. I know it's February already, but it's still a new year, still a new start, new energy. Hold on to that vibe. I love you all. Take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. And I will talk to you next Tuesday. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Peace. <laughs>